chug, 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 Hello and welcome back to the Wizard Staff. I'm your host, Guy. And I'm Blake. And we are two drunk novices who like to talk about EDH. We drink and swear, so you've been warned. Please drink responsibly when you're talking about children's card games. Tonight, we are returning back to one of our most done segments, a common deck theme. And this is the big one, everyone, because I know everybody's been like, oh my god, guy always talks about his perforos deck. <laughs> when are we going to be able to get like a little sneak peek or like, you know, when can I learn more about it? And I'm happy to say that's what this whole episode is dedicated to. Burn. Burn, baby. Disco Inferno. Oh, yeah. So we're going to talk about what Burn is, how to play it and build it, some of the popular commanders, and then we're going to kind of do like a Q&A discussion at the end because Blake, my mm-hmm. lovely co-host here, he, he can kind of speak to it as well. He plays a Gisela, <laughs> the... The Blade Knight? The Gold Blade Knight? <laughs> what is it? Close enough. But what is it? Like, I, I genuinely forget. Blade of Gold Knight. Blade of Gold Knight. There we go. And, okay. Before we get into that, we gotta, we gotta say, what are we drinking? What are we drinking tonight, Blake? It's the most fitting of beverages. It is Fireball. Yeah. Oof. The cinnamon whiskey. <laughs> Oh, gosh. I haven't had this stuff since, like, I think when we did the Kess deck tech drinking theme deck tech. Yes. Uh, Kess Dissident Mage, we did a whole deck tech where we built the deck around drinking. So whether it was based on an alcohol or if it had like a cup in it, you know, that was kind of like how we built the deck. And Fireball was a card also in that deck. And if you're if you're just unfamiliar with the card, I'm gonna read it real quick. It is X in a red sorcery. Fireball deals X damage divided evenly, rounded down among any number of target creatures and or players. And it costs one more to cast for each target beyond the first. When we talk about Burn tonight, we will kind of talk about how like this card is what I would say a staple in the burn decks in other formats but in edh that's not so much the case all right so i'm gonna take my last shot of fireball and then Ooh, we're gonna get started you do that and i'll and i'll take a pull you'll take a I, don't, I can't find my shot glass i'll take a pull oh you know. that's right okay yeah yeah all right three <laughs> two one two one oh <laughs> <laughs> Mm. It does not get easier. Oh. <laughs> nope. Just a life in general motto does mm-hmm. not get easier. <laughs> One thing too before we get started is that we have our Force of Will giveaway announcement and that winner is DVMTG who also happens to have a YouTube channel that we will link down below. So make sure that you go check them out. And we thank everyone for subscribing to the channel. In this time, we are very close, if not have already hit 100 subscribers. And we are now a third of the way to our goal so that we can be recognized on EDA Trek page. (laughs) All right, so what is burn? So a burn deck is a deck strategy that uses direct damage spells as its primary win condition. These burn spells tend to involve fire and or lightning, such as lightning bolt and fire blast. Most are mono red, but occasionally you get a Boros, Gruul, Rakdos, or even like an Izzet burn deck, you know, for like some splashy flavor. And that's the wiki definition, just taken straight out (laughs) of the Wikipedia. Copy paste. Objective truth. Yep. So. In Modern and Legacy, burn decks are seen as like a good introduction, since they are relatively cheap ways to start to format. While they're not inherently like the strongest in those formats too, they probably just won't ever really go away due to their accessibility. So along with the very common Lightning Bolt and Fire Blast, some other burn decks kind of like staples include Lava Spike, 
Rift Bolt, Flame Rift, Searing Blaze, Burrow's Charm, Skull Crack, Chain Lightning, Price of Progress, and of course, Fireball. Oh, that, that's right. There's the Pitbull song where it's like, Fireball. <laughs> so, in these decks, they tend to have like high powered creatures with like low CMC with haste to get in early damage. If you can kind of already tell from what we've been saying, the idea of this deck is to reduce your opponent's life total to zero as fast as possible. And in those other formats, turn three or four isn't uncommon. And they rely on the fact that those decks will punish players for taking advantage of power powerful cards that use their life total as a resource. So like in Legacy, Force of Will or like Thought Seize are heavily played cards, but they do require like some of you, some of it to like pay some life. And when your life total is 20, it's not as high in EDH so it's kind of hard to you know think of life as a resource in that way you need to be a little more um what's a good word Blake what's a good word <laughs> cautious I guess yeah that's, that's one way to put it I can definitely feel the alcohol effect in me already oh boy <laughs> well, yeah well th I've taken three shots before <laughs> we even started so you know you're up. just gonna see like my downward spiral it's going to be kind of similar to when we did the mono white episode and just by like the middle of it i was like slurring my words i had no idea what i was saying <laughs> but it was a good time baby all right so we've kind of explained well i've kind of explained what a modern and legacy burn deck is but this is not modern this is not legacy this is commander and in Commander, the amount of damage you need to do to effectively, like, kill your opponents goes from 20 to 120, because you typically will have three opponents, not just one, and all of them will have a starting life total of 40. It makes it a lot more difficult when, you know, you're needing to plan cards. Like, you're not going to have as many, like, single target burn spells you're going to be looking for those cards that say like each opponent or just things that will trigger based on like very common actions that you do in magic so like whenever you cast an instant or sorcery whenever you play a land things like that like w what kind of i guess before moving forward like common commanders that we'll be talking about what has been your general experience when playing your Gisela deck? Uh, well, that deck typically tries to make the game go as long as possible so that, you know, hopefully some combat has been had, some life totals have been going down. And then using Gisela, I can asymmetrically burn everybody, leaving me alive and all of my opponents dead. Uh, that's typically how it operates. Right, because she's a key piece in that deck where she's having the amount of life that you're taking but doubling the amount of life uh, doubling the amount of damage that is being dealt to your opponents yeah she breaks the parity and there are other cards that can do that but you know when you have that sort of effect in the command zone you might as well utilize it yeah so. but she costs a lot of mana and you need the game needs to go long enough for you to actually cast her <laughs> And it's interesting that you say that the game needs to go long enough because that's not the traditional sense of what burn is, like we've kind of talked about. Because burn decks try to go like fast. Right, and I think that shows the variety within the burn archetype. In EDH, specifically. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't think a modern burn deck or a legacy burn deck will be like, yeah, we're just going to have this game go on for two hours and I'm going to slowly get your life total to go down. No, they're probably already going to be done with <laughs> five games by that point. Right. But what about, like, I guess, when you sit down at, you know, your local game store, or, like, when you would, but is that... What would be kind of the general reaction someone would give you when, you know, they see Gisela? 
Oh man, I I have been kind of struggling with the fact that when I play Gisela, and a lot of people do not like it. They just ooh, they realize how much damage they're taking. People get nervous when their life total starts getting near zero, and then they're just like, "All right, we we gotta kill him," even though like I'm taking some damage too. But like sometimes I think some of them don't do good threat assessment and kill me instead of killing someone else but oh well so yeah like uh, that part that might also be because i run a bunch of hate bears in order for the game to go long <laughs> like people don't like hate bears so maybe that's part of the problem <laughs> right and i mean i ask that because i have a very similar answer when i play perforos it's when he comes out and i start doing my thing i'm doing 20 to 30 damage almost a turn around the table collectively if not more and it gets to a point where it's like okay we're losing a lot of life quickly and he's even like doing stuff that's not even on his turn to like deal us damage we need to like interact and almost you know you become arch enemy sometimes yeah it definitely depends on the pod yeah it definitely feels like a vice if they're not familiar with the deck, then they're not going to know, like, oh, yeah, we need to, like, take care of this now, or else it's just going to get crazy real fast. All right. So, what are some common commanders when it comes to burn? And this is kind of interesting, because we went to EDH Rec to pull the five most common, quote-unquote, burn commanders. And, Blake, can you read me this list? Sure, I'll just read them off. It is number one, Torbran, Thrain of Redfell. Number two, Firesong and Sunspeaker. Number three, Neheb the Eternal. Number four, Obosh the Prey Piercer. And Sir Kara the Bold. This is interesting simply because I think you and I both agree, and I think a lot of more experienced EDH players will agree that these aren't necessarily the top five best burn commanders. Yeah, it definitely kind of speaks to the fact that. It definitely speaks to what we've been talking about so far, and these, I think, are categorized as traditional burn decks, but they're not going to be nearly as effective as some of the ones that we're about to talk about, because they're not taking advantage of the four-player format. And I think just when EDH Rec kind of, like, has this sorting and they kind of like categorize spells and they'll like categorize stuff as like burn. They will just kind of like notice that, okay, these decks tend to use a lot of those like traditional burn cards that you would see in like other formats, but that those cards aren't necessarily nearly as effective in Commander. So you get like these decks, but then, you know, we have all these other decks that work so much better, so much better. Right. It basically is a good example of how EDH rec certain parts of it can be really helpful and useful but at the end of the day it's just a tool you always got to take it with a grain of salt some parts of it aren't that helpful so what are some like actual good examples of perforos god of the forge baby <laughs> that's the best one it is true though yeah well yes it is definitely a good one and i'm already going to just start speaking to it cuz you can just gush first off Perforos himself has a very good burn ability. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you deal 2 damage to each of your opponents. The great thing about that is that it is each of your opponents, and it is taking advantage of something that you're probably going to be doing every turn, and that is casting a creature. The other great thing about him is he is only 4 CMC, so it is very easy to get him out turn 3 or 4. Like, that's kind of like you know, a typical move to do. And he's one of the Theros gods, which are indestructible enchantments that don't turn into creatures until you have a certain amount of devotion. So it's like a... It's quite a bitch to get rid of him, to be honest. Like, it, you need targeted exiled enchantment removal, and that's not, like, the easiest thing to come across. It's very limited into what colors can do that in the first place. Yeah, I totally agree that it's definitely one of the better burn commanders. And when I think of burn, Perforos is probably like my very first 
thought in EDH at least. Mm -hmm. So what's our next one? So our next commander is Torbran Thane of Red Fell, and he is one and a red 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 for a 2-4 legendary creature dwarf noble. If a red source you control would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent an opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus two instead. So what you kind of do with this is you play a lot of cards that have effects that deal lots of incremental damage, like one damage if you do this, or one damage if you do that. And then Torbran makes it, oh, it's three damage for this, and three damage for that, and that really adds up over the course of the game, and really pressures people's life totals. Yeah, and you're definitely probably wanting to be putting in some kind of like damage doublers as well, or even with like the new Fiery Emancipation, since those cards will also want to like get the most out of the damage that you're trying to deal. Just a little quick judge ruling, I guess, that I learned, but when you are taking damage and you are experiencing multiple replacement effects, which is the statements that typically start with if, the person who would then be taking the damage is the one who's going to be deciding how that's going to stack and so oftentimes you will want the fiery emancipation or like the dictate of twin gods to resolve first and then add on torbran because if you add on torbran first you're adding on two and then that whole like number so let's say it goes from one to three and then you triple that that's nine whereas if you go one to three by tripling it then you add two to get five so if you're going up against a burnt deck just try and keep that in mind it's actually a very good point and i'm glad you brought that up mm -hmm. yes all right i can also speak to this next commander which is omnath locus of rage it is three and red red green green for a five five legendary creature elemental and it has landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, create a 5-5 red and green elemental creature token. Whenever Omnath Locus of Rage or another elemental you control dies, Omnath deals 3 damage to any target. So this deck plays a lot of lands, gets a lot of landfall triggers, goes wide with all of these elemental tokens, and then is able to sack them to deal just tons of damage. I have personally played against this deck quite often, against my friend Park, who's been on this podcast a number of times now, and I would say he's fully tuned the deck, he's just missing a Guy's Cradle and a 3 Visits, I believe, and it is able to burn you out consistently on turns 8 and 9, and yeah, you're just dead. It, it can, it's one of the better burn decks in my personal opinion. Yeah, it... When you first like brought this up, I was definitely kind of like, really? Because when you look at Omnath, it is kind of a very intense like mana cost. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you want to make sure that like when he comes out, that is like the only time that he comes out, because then you just want to be winning from there. Like he is, what, 7 CMC? Mm -hmm. what, what turn do you think to typically Park will be able to bring him out. Oh, he always brings him out, like, turn five. Pretty okay, so that's actually much better, because that's, like, two turns ahead of Curve. And he's probably just playing, like, a lot of those land cards that will say, like, go get me more lands, that will then just kind of, like, ramp him at the same time. And then those that'll also trigger with his ability. So, yeah, okay. You know, makes sense. Seems pretty good. Pretty good. Omnath is very much a very angry jelly bean. <laughs> yeah, and we will definitely be talking about him in one of our upcoming episodes for Zendikar because, you know, he's gone from one color to two color to three color, and now he's at four colors. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> nice plug. Thank you. Uh, so next we have Halar, the Fire Fletcher. One red green legendary creature elf archer has trample. Whenever you cast a spell, if that spell was kicked, put a plus one plus one counter on Howler. Then Howler deals damage equal to the number of plus one plus one counters on it to each opponent. 
and not to just keep plugging ourselves but like this will definitely get kind of a boost with the upcoming Zendikar set because a lot of cards are going to <laughs> kicker. Have, yeah, kicker on it. So I think this is pretty good because, you know, it's a low CMC, it deals damage to each of your opponents, and kicker is a mechanic that's been supported for a very long time. So there are plenty of cards to kind of like that can go in this deck. So I've never personally seen one. I do know that I've mentioned this before, but like there was a brawl tournament once and there was only like one person who showed up to like play. And I believe this was the commander that he used for brawl and just oh, yeah? won by default. Yeah. Cause it was around Dominaria when this like tournament happened and when brawl was like first announced <laughs> and this card does come from Dominaria. So you know, this card's just like a killer in Brawl, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tier zero, basically. Everyone just like saw it and just didn't even enter. Mm -hmm. So next we have Norrin the Wary, who is probably one of my other... He'd probably be a pet card in Perforos, just because like you get him out and... Well, okay. Yeah, so he is one red mana, legendary creature, human warrior. When a player plays a spell or a creature attacks, remove Norn the Wary from the game, return it to play under its owner's control at end of turn. And he's a 2-1. So this card definitely is kind of like a staple in my Perforos deck because, you know, you put him out, he's only one red mana, and then you play something else, you get him to like pretty much bounce. Triggers Perforos. Next time your opponent plays something, pretty much bounce. And it's just, you know, you get around the table and he's easily done uh, six damage to everyone. And it, he is also very difficult to get rid of just because you need some kind of like activated, activated ability that's going to deal damage to him. Or a board wipe that doesn't target. Oh, wait. No, 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 no. The board wipe would trigger him to then bounce. Right. Fuck, yeah. He is hard to get rid of. Yeah, he is definitely one of the cards that, you know, if you have him in opening hand or, like, if you have Imperial Recruiter, he's a good go grab for Perforos specifically. But, okay, enough talking about him in Perforos. What about playing him as a commander? He's also kind of very interesting because he's taking advantage of playing cheap spells you want to then get a bunch of like etb triggers so impact tremors perforos war storm surge and it's just kind of you know every turn you're dealing a lot of damage just to make it kind of difficult for you know your opponents to do anything and then you can just kind of like go off and then start dealing more damage. Mm -hmm. And he's only one red mana. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Alright. So there are also a few other commanders that we'd like to talk about that are kind of, how would you say, it's sort of like a Venn diagram. They kind of intertwine with burn, but I wouldn't directly call them burn. That, that would be a good way of putting it. Yeah, so the examples I'm thinking of are the Niv-Mizzets, Nekusar, and Rollin and Shabraz, because they technically win the game by dealing damage to your face, but I wouldn't categorize them as burn. I'd categorize them as wheel decks where they just happen to win with burn. Yeah, it it's Do weird. Do you disagree? I mean, I guess, no. I, I was just kind of like, thinking about it and I mean I guess we gotta give examples to like you know explain what we're trying to say so who are some of the three first ones so Niv-Mizzet has curiosity combos where the combos with the card or cards with effects like curiosity that they form an infinite loop where you draw a card deal the damage oh you dealt damage draw a card. You drew a card, deal a damage, and it just goes infinite and you burn all of your opponents out. Then there's also Nekusar, which is just essentially wheels tribal. You just 
wield someone's hand, everyone's hands, everyone takes a bunch of damage for every card that they're drawing, and you do that over and over and over again, kill them that way. Uh, same exact deal basically with Brawlin and Shabraz. Again, you can do the curiosity combo and nuke all of your opponents in the face with fire. Yeah, I, I would call that burn in a way. It's almost like the inclination that I have is to say that's not burn, but when you kind of just like think about it, it's like, but why isn't it? So that's kind of I, it definitely doesn't fall into the traditional sense, I think. Right, and that's mostly because, at least with when you traditionally think of burn, it's like, all right, that is your primary win condition. Whereas, like, you know, okay, maybe a, an example would be like Omnath, Locus of Rage that we talked about earlier. Yes, it's a lands matter deck, but it's more appropriate to say it's a burn deck simply because... Why are you playing all those lands? Well, to burn people. Uh, where? See, it's it's a little bit fuzzy, isn't it? it uh, yeah, because not... I'm sure. I'm sure if you were playing one of these decks and you were drawing a bunch of cards, and I like stop the damage somehow, I bet you you're still going to have some kind of like win condition that you've planned in your deck. Whereas burn is literally that is the win condition is to burn your opponents that's it whereas these decks maybe they're running well Raylan and Shabraz and Niv Mizzet they can run lab man if you're going to be drawing all those cards too you that's could like true. win off of that or like Jace Wilder Mysteries that kind of thing Nekusar too that's a perfect example Okay, so the next commander we that we'd like to talk about is Feather the Redeemed, and Guy, you and I can talk about this a little bit, but for me, there's kind of two builds with Feather the Redeemed. Either you build it kind of like a Voltron deck, in which you try and deal 21 points of commander damage to each of your opponents, and I've played against that. I have not found it to be that successful. That's not to say like your Feather Voltron deck can't do that. I'm just fu I'm just saying I f don't find it that successful in contrast to the other build of Feather, which is sort of doing that, but your primary win condition is to land cards like Gutter Snipe and Electrostatic Field and other effects that deal damage to your, all of your opponents based on like the number of non-creature spells or instants and sorceries you play because that seems to be a lot more effective. Voltron has a lot of weaknesses. If you want to learn all the weaknesses of Voltron, you can listen to our episode on it. No, don't, don't go plugging yourself. This is my episode. <laughs> you did it. I'm this doing my, it. Fuck you. I, I did it for the full channel. That The Voltron episode was your thing. <laughs> this is my thing. <laughs> don't listen to Blake. Uh... But no, you can go listen to that episode. Because I think Blake does have a good point. I personally have seen the Voltron build actually kind of work out for my friend Jesse, who played Feather for a while. And that was kind of like his primary win condition was that style. And so when I saw that, you know, Blake had written Feather the Redeemed, I needed kind of an explanation of like, well, how does this work as a burn card? Or like a burn commander? Because this doesn't seem like you know <laughs> its primary way of wanting to win because typically when you like read your commander it's going to give you like the general like sense of like oh uh, this is how you play the deck right so there are really those two builds of feather there's the voltron and then there's the mass burn and neither way is 100 percent correct it's kind of whatever you want to do all right, I'd like to move into the last sort of category of burn, but not quite, and that is group slug. Uh, that's what I call it, at least. And this has Gisela, Blade of Gold Knight, Mogus, God of Slaughter, and Zozu, the Punisher, where it's really about slowing down the game and trying to make the game as slow as possible and do a lot of incremental 
damage here and there, and maybe at the very end, do a giant nuking of players to go for the win. At least that's my experience with these three decks. Yeah, that de that definitely, I think, falls into the category of burn, where it's you're just wanting to deal like lots of damage. That's like the primary win condition. These all definitely seem like they could be pretty strong. Gisela, like you know, is also like a sort of protection for yourself. Mogus triggers every upkeep for like the player. And Zozu takes advantage of the fact that, you know, players are going to be playing lands every turn. So <laughs> it's definitely just going to be taking advantage of the fact that it's a common thing that happens in Magic and wants to, you know, punish you for doing that. Mm -hmm. So moving into some bad examples, just to kind of like give you a perspective of like, okay, here's the good ones what are some bad ones and that this isn't to necessarily say you shouldn't play these commanders but we just don't think that these are necessarily the strongest as burn commanders you can build them this way if you want to but there may also be other ways of building them that might just be more effective so the first is ashling pilgrim and but i mean like i feel like you have a little more knowledge of like why this isn't necessarily like a good burn commander. Can you explain it? Ashling the Pilgrim is one in a red for a one one elemental shaman. And it has an activated ability of one in a red, put a plus one plus one counter on Ashling. If this is the third time this ability has resolved this turn, remove all plus one plus one counters from Ashling the Pilgrim. And it deals that much damage to each creature and each player. So it's got some things going for it. It's low CMC, so you can get it out pretty early. But, you know, this is going to be a mono red deck, and it's going to be very difficult to pump up Ashling with all those plus one plus one counters on it. And then, what do you get for removing all of those plus one plus one counters? Like, very small amount of burn. So, in a format like EDH, where everyone has just so much life, this is just so incredibly slow in contrast to a lot of the commanders that we've previously been talking about again you can totally build this but it's going to be much less powerful maybe that's what you're looking for but uh that's just something to keep in mind mm -hmm. it, i guess it kind of does relate to the next commander which is marith will of the wild uh because it is a red green white legendary creature elemental beast it enters the battlefield with a number of plus one plus one counters on it equal to the amount of mana spent to cast to it and then it has generic x remove x plus one plus one counters from marif and then you choose one put x plus one plus one counters on target creature or marif deals x damage to target creature or player or put a xx screen elemental creature token onto the battlefield so this definitely it seems like, you know, you could do this in multiple ways, so it does have that versatility, but I feel like this, to make it effective, is, you know, you're going to be wanting to make sure that it gets a bunch of plus one, plus one counters on it, to then remove those plus one, plus one counters, so there's just a bunch of steps that need to be involved, and it's not going to be then dealing the damage to each of your opponents, and if that were the case, I'd say like, okay, well, maybe the, then this is like a worthwhile build, but it, it's only one player, so, and then once you remove all those counters, you either have a really weak commander, or, you know, it goes back to the command zone, and then you're just going to kind of have to, you know, recast it and try and do it all over again. So it just feels like there are a lot of hurdles to really make this a, an efficient burn commander. Right, you can totally build it that casual way, where it's not very effective compared to the commanders we talked about earlier the there's also a way to build Marath um, as a combo deck that can be quite powerful but that's exactly what it is it's a combo deck that just happens to win by doing burn damage so it's mm. it's either way you build it it's not really a burn deck not by traditional definitions so that's why it's technically a bad example here yeah it, it just doesn't seem like it's 
you know, a front runner for sure. So our next commander we have on the list is Bosch Iron Golem. For eight colorless mana, you get a six, seven legendary artifact creature Golem with Trample. And as an activated ability of three and a red, sacrifice an artifact, Bosch deals damage equal to the sacrificed artifacts converted mana cost to any target. And this was, I'd say, become a recently more popular commander because of Ashlyn Rose's playing of it on extra turns on the Command Zone podcast. Yeah, and I know that they continue to reprint him. He seems like he's a favorite for some reason. I think that if you are going to build him, he's not going to be... Again, your traditional burn commander, just because it not every opponent. Uh, the nice thing is you could do it to any target, and he is a high CMC. He is eight mana, even though it is generic. So I don't know. The way that Ashlyn also used him was she would like sacrifice Boro. Uh, sorry, not Boros. He she would sacrifice Bosch himself which seemed <laughs> ineffective to me because I'm like, okay, now you have to recast him, though, to then deal more damage. And if that's the case, then, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think I don't think he's going to be, again, he's not going to be a front runner. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's, I mean, it's kind of cool. It does something u- unique, but it's, again, kind of compared to the other commanders, a bit slow. Yeah. So this next one, Brian Stoutarm? Stout- yeah. Stoutarm? Something yeah. like that. Two red white legendary creature, giant warrior, has lifelink. For red and tap, sacrifice another creature. He deals damage equal to the sacrifice creature's power to target player. And he's a 4 4. And again, when you're playing burn, you do want to be efficient and fast. This just seems like you're sacrificing one creature a turn to deal some amount of damage. To another player it you're not going to be necessarily untapping and tapping and untapping and untapping and doing this kind of like continuous loop with him i don't think that that's really in brian brian's like game plan unless if you you know build it like aurelia where you're just taking infinite combat steps to then you know tap and untap all your creatures a bunch but in that way, I'm like, okay, if you have infinite attack steps, then you're just going to be winning through infinite attack steps. You're not really winning through burn. So, again, not, not necessarily a great example. I will say that I've looked at a lot of deck techs for this commander and kind of tried to look into it myself. And, I mean, he can eventually start, like, dealing 30 damage or 40 damage or more to someone's face. It just doesn't happen until, like turn 13 or 14 and it takes a lot of setup to get that to work right it's those hurdles that you're trying to like overcome in order to make it work yeah all right we got one more like bad example like why don't you read it all right so our last one here is borborygmos enraged it is four and red red green green and it is a Cyclops that's a 7 6 with Trample. Whenever Borborygmos Enraged deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top three cards of your library. Put all land cards revealed this way into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Discard a land. Borborygmos Enraged deals three damage to any target. So, I think one of the major difficulties of this commander is the high CMC. Now, you can't totally run a bunch of ramp. I was just telling you how Omnath, Locust of Rage, can be played by playing a bunch of ramp. So that can be mitigated to some degree. Well, I would argue that that's not in your best, best interest, unless if, you know, you're directly just trying to get those lands into your hand. Because you do want to Mm. be discarding those lands in order to get or Bob to go off. (laughs) Borb. (laughs) The Borb. Yeah, uh, I wanted you to read it because I was like, I'm too drunk. 
Oh no, we're at that part of the episode. <laughs> oh no. We've been yeah. there. <laughs> I know. I didn't think we'd get there that fast though. Yeah, so I mean, it's definitely kind of land focused, burn focused, but it's just very slow. It's a little bit clunky and it's it's just a bit slow. You can totally yeah, do it though. You're if you you're want. trying to jump over some hurdles. You're not really relying on casting cheap stuff to deal the damage. If you kill me with this commander, I will buy you three beers. Wow, Blake keeps like upping the ante when it comes to this kind of stuff. Where he's like, oh, if you can do this, I'll buy you some alcohol. Oh, if you can do this, I'll buy you some more alcohol. Yeah, so... so we're just going to go to a command fest and, you know, some, some guy's going to walk up to Blake, smack him around with a bunch of things. Blake's going to be like at a bar while our fans just like downing 10 beers <laughs> oh i'd be perfectly fine with that yeah all right so just kind of summarize but good examples rely on cheap cards that synergize with the commander to deal damage without having to pay additional costs and they're dealing damage to each of your opponents Bad examples would be that they are high mana intensity and they do not hit every opponent on the same turn or same time. Yeah, or there's just like a lot of hurdles to jump through. Yeah. So what are some strategies and cards that kind of like hurt your game plan? Uh, there's one specifically that comes to mind and that is life gain. Uh, life gain is a bitch when it comes to these kind of decks hard fact uh i didn't really think about it when i built my very first perforos deck and once i learned or saw some opponents like get way ahead with a life i was like okay yeah i need to like look in to see how can i stop them so what are some good cards to do that you got leyline of punishment witch hunt rampaging ferocidon Havoc Festival, Everlasting Torment, Sulfuric Vortex, Tybalt, Brackish, and Brackish Instigator, Erebos, God of the Dead, and the new card from Zendikar Rising that we'll probably talk more about in our set review, but Roiling Vortex, and all of these have a condition on them that allows you to stop your opponents from gaining life, which, very, very helpful. Wasn't it like... A Johnny Mentor of Heroes did the minus eight and they gained like a hundred life. Is, isn't that what happened? Uh, I don't, I don't quite remember, but like that was just a long game. And I think I had to mill out that person in order to win. Oh, it that's was, what it was. It was difficult, but yeah, that card also, no, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even that good of a card. All right, yeah, but that totally makes sense. Playing all these cards that prevent your opponents from gaining life, and because it directly screws over a burn deck, makes sense. All right, I approve. Yeah, and I guess the other generic kind of decks that are better against burn are just decks that play faster, and that's also one of the reasons why I've been trying to say like. You know, you do want low CMC stuff that will be dealing lots of damage because you don't want your opponents to outpace you because I've run into this problem several times where once, you know, I've dealt a lot of damage to opponents and it's at a point where someone can go and kind of like take the win from you, players will do that. They take advantage of the fact that you're going to be riding or doing a lot of the heavy lifting only for them to then come in and win based off of your hard work. Yeah, that happens in a, it's not just burn, but it definitely is a problem for burn where like you do all the heavy lifting and then someone next in turn order, it's like, all right, I'm just gonna take this opportunity to do the last bit of damage to everybody's life total and win. And you're like, motherfucker, I did all the work. Yeah. All right, well, would you like to move into the next section of this episode and talk about the generically burn relevant cards yes so we're just gonna kind of you know you have your commander what are some additional cards that 
you know, you want to be running in your deck. So first, as just kind of like a generically good card, is Heartless Hidetsugu. Hide yeah, that sounds right. You? <laughs> yeah. A reminder, we drink on this podcast. <laughs> uh, I feel like we haven't said that enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do drink on this podcast. Ugh. Yeah, he is three red red legendary creature ogre shaman and when you tap him he deals damage to each player equal to half that player's life total rounded down so it is a very good way of being able to deal lots of damage very quickly especially like i don't know because he will be you know just like best case scenario he comes down and he just takes out 20 life from everyone because you're all at 40 life. Or he is good against, like, you know, the life gain decks again. Like, if you weren't playing cards that were gaining you life, he now, you know, halves that person who is at 100 to 50. And then you hopefully can maybe untap him one more time so you can get them down from 50 to 25. So, yeah, it, it seems like he's a good way of trying to get control of the people who are getting out of control yeah it's just one of the best cards at getting rid of huge chunks of life totals and side note this is basically a two card combo if you play gisela as your commander because it taps deals damage equal to half and then gisela doubles it so it basically kills them yeah that's cool there too we also have damage multipliers Cards kind of like Fiery Emancipation, Dictate of the Twin Gods, Furnace of Wrath, and Angras Marauders. These are all cards that are essentially doubling damage or tripling the damage so that whether it's incremental damage or large amounts of damage, it's getting to a point where, oh, it actually matters to commander players. It's actually a lot. Yeah, definitely helping you get those like small bits of damage that you're doing every turn to then just incrementally get much further ahead we got some group damage spells and these definitely work better with some of those red rituals that you have access to like mana geyser battleheim and irin crag feet where it's like tap for five at mana to your mana pool based on the number of tap lands so uh, you have like earthquake where it's like x red deal damage to each creature without flying and each player rolling earthquake molten disaster fault line a lot of, price of progress yeah price of progress being the one exception there so yeah th these will deal damage to each of your opponents and they are relatively like low cmc and again, if you are getting them to, if you're getting them to a low enough life total, these could be like your game finishing pieces. Next, we have like when you do something, you hurt your opponent. It's like electrostatic field, gutter snipe, firebrand archer. A lot of these say like, oh, when you cast instant or sorcery spell, deal one damage or deal two damage to your opponent. Non-creature spell, deal one damage to your opponent. And again, taking advantage of the fact that you're just going to be doing these probably every turn. It adds up. Yeah, it just adds up all the time when you just do it uh, because that's like a basic game function. All right, then you have the next category, which is like when your opponents do something, they kind of hurt themselves. So one good example is Karavek the Merciless and Harsh Mentor. I particularly like the original Karavek because a the art's really cool <laughs> therefore it's a good card but it also has the effect of whenever an opponent casts a spell this card deals damage to any target equal to that spell's converted mana cost and i don't know if you've noticed this but commander players like to play a ton of spells so they're gonna do a bunch of damage to themselves <laughs> yeah same with harsh mentor it's tough when you're going to be activating something to like draw a card create a treasure token or something and it's going to just punish you for doing again basic 
functions in the game that you're probably like relying on to do. It makes your opponents have to like really stop, think like, okay, uh, how do I work around this? Or like, it just slows them down because it might say like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'm just going to wait another turn until someone else deals with it. Or if they don't deal with it, I'll deal with it next turn. So, yeah, uh, I think a lot of these kind of cards where it says like when somebody does something, especially your opponents, and it hurts themselves, are key pieces. And the next kind of goes into when anybody does something, it'll hurt them. So these are kind of like stacks pieces that slow down your opponents to punish them from getting too far ahead. So you have like Spell Shock, Mana Barbs, Citadel of Pain, Ankh of Mishra, and Zozu the Punisher, where these cards are just going to make your opponents want to play slower or really need them to like consider and like what is their best line of action in order for them to work around this kind of like damage that is just going to hurt them and you know I mean that's what you want but you also don't want to make sure you you just want to make sure that they have less inclination to interact with you yeah do you do you run citadel of pain just because a lot of burn decks don't often run a lot of instant speed interaction aside from like well there's a few i shouldn't say that yeah so i guess citadel of pain is a little different from the other ones that i mentioned and i'll speak to it because it is a card that deals damage to you at your end step based on the number of untapped lands that you have. And the idea is that you want your opponents to tap out at the end of their turns so that when it comes time to your turn, they're tapped out and you are able to, you know, play your spells without having to worry as much. So, or if they do want to, like, hold up for like interaction they're gonna have to you know uh deal with it, it it's kind of similar to um what was the one that i just took off price of glory <laughs> where you know if you tap a land during another player's turn it's going to make them have to sacrifice that land so it just slows down their interaction with you and allows you to kind of like play your spells not really having to worry about other people Okay. I've, I've always been a little bit iffy about Citadel of Pain because it incentivizes people to tap out, and it's like, okay, they might be tapped out for you, but that also means they're tapped out to, like, supposedly the two other opponents who might just, like, combo out and everybody tapped out because of Citadel. So I've always been kind of iffy on the card, but I, I understand why people run it. It's a very good amount of damage per your mana cost investment. Yeah. All right, so let's kind of wrap it up with a little discussion here. Um, okay. So just speaking from like my personal experience, I think if you are going to play Burn, you just want to embrace this as your strategy. You don't want to hold back. You just need to take full advantage of the fact that you are dealing damage and making sure that every card in your deck helps in that kind of way. Uh, the hardest part about playing Burn for me personally is that you play burn the blowout. well it's more so like the blowout finish because again other people can you know take the fact that take advantage of the fact that you've done all the hard work and then they're just going to swing in for some damage to then just kill someone but it also is very much about like calculations and making sure you sequence the number of the cards that you play so that it deals the right amount of damage because if you don't succeed and people see like oh you were about to just kill us weren't you they don't they don't like that they don't like that like oh i know they don't i know they don't firecat blitz is a card that just personally speaking has always been very difficult for me because i try to get a bunch of cats out and then try and recast it to get bunch more cats out but I don't always do like the mana right and it always ends up like blowing up in my face <laughs> more so than it does 
than it is something to like actually help me. I think you just need to like get good. Shut up. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think Burn is a pretty fun archetype to play around with. It's pretty simple. You just like look your opponents dead in the eye and just be like, I'm gonna burn you all. <laughs> And hopefully you do. And it's a fun time. Yeah, I, I hope that there are more commanders in the future that specifically relate to Burn. Because it feels like we have like some that are good. Perforos, the second Omnath, Torbran, but... But that's kind of it, right? Like there's not like, there's not like 10 or 20 like well-known like good decks within this archetype. Yeah, and it's really then just kind of like says to the ones that do try to become burned, like, this is then the best that we got. And I know that it's not the strategy for EDH necessarily, but I would be like really curious to like see if we do get a burn commander who is more burn in that traditional sense. So I, I don't know what he would look like, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. I hope Watsi has something in store. Yeah. All of you listening, you can totally let us know if we've missed uh, a commander that you think can be a great burn commander. Or if you want to talk about your personal experiences playing burn, you can totally uh, hit us up. We are on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. Leave us a comment. Just hit us up on other platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WizardStaff101. You can send us an email at thewizardstaff101 at gmail.com. You can hit us up there. All right. Thank you all so much for listening, and we hope that you guys have a great night. Peace. Peace.